So I'm basically uh, just on the hunt to wear all of the most uh, obnoxious tiger-related clothing I can find. So new Cronenberg, I was actually lucky enough to catch this on premiere night at the Cannes Film Festival. Obviously, because of Cronenberg himself and his prestige, uh, not at all because Kristen Stewart's in the movie. Definitely not. Genuinely surprised I wasn't put on some kind of watch list. They just let me in the press conference. Obviously, I am joking. I should not be put on a watch list. I am a very normal person. But honestly, I would have been gunning for opening night tickets regardless of who is in this movie. So Crimes of the Future is not a remake or continuation or prequel or sequel of Cronenberg's 1970s movie of the same name. It's just a different exploration of the idea of a futuristic crime and there's just no similarities to the plot. He wrote the script 20 years ago, so it's like very impressive how relevant so much of it still is. Especially considering he says he didn't change anything from the script, and I think that that's mostly because so many of our issues have simply just continued and compounded over time. But if I'm being honest, the script probably could have used a little bit of work before filming. Just saying. This 2022 iteration takes place in a world where the human body has begun to internally mutate and change as a result of the rapidly shifting and synthetic environment. Little changes are happening everywhere, but some people have actually begun growing new organs. While the governing bodies seek to stop most of these changes as an incorrect evolutionary path in humans. And some of these new organs serve no function, and some of them choose to actually grow things that have no function, like this ear man and his performative dances, but other people are actually growing organs that are functioning, which can't be allowed. We'll dive into all the goodies of like the gore level, plot and execution, starting off with no spoilers before we dive into my specific thoughts. But speaking of ear man, if all of those ears were actually functional, he would certainly need a lot of well-priced earbuds to enjoy his performance arts tunes. So he should definitely turn to today's sponsor, Raycon. See, I'm the type of person who can't be expected to do much of anything if I'm not also listening to something. Whether it's a video, music, or audio book. If I'm out and about running errands, cleaning up around the house, or getting in some kind of physical activity like walking my lazy ass to Starbucks, I need entertainment. And Raycon come in clutch with their quality and stylish everyday earbuds that are more comfortable than ever thanks to their new optimized gel tips that keep them in place no matter what I'm doing. They also have cool features like noise isolation or awareness mode that you can toggle through by holding down on your right ear, but for three seconds, as well as being Siri and Alexa compatible. With eight hours of playtime, a 32 hour battery life, compact fit, and a variety of colors, Raycon are guaranteed to have the perfect pair for you starting about half the price of other premium wireless brands. So if you wanna find out why Raycon have so many five-star reviews, head on over to buyraycon.com slash Jedi, or click the link in the description down below to save 15% on your Raycon purchase. So I know a lot of you were excited and expecting this to be like Cronenberg's most viscerally graphic film to date. Something that would put his son's most recent psychological horror possessor to shame. The trailer had people squeaming con attendees, including myself, were anticipating mass walkouts and uncomfortable nausea-inducing experience and were met with, well, not that. Turns out that most of the graphic scenes were all in the trailer. I'm not saying that there weren't any moments that felt uncomfortable and were graphic, but I feel like there is a central element to this film that pulls some of the steam out of the squeam, uh, and beyond that, it largely felt toned down. And I'm not remotely saying that that's a bad thing. I am saying that if you're expecting this to push limits in that way, uh, you're not gonna get it, in my opinion. And honestly, not what Cronenberg himself would be after, considering his like basic rejection of the body horror label itself. Also. So it was a lot funnier than I expected. Though I do appreciate that this wasn't a movie just ignoring all substance in favor of just trying to make something gross, which so often happens. Maybe it's because the trailer had me expecting so much that it seemed tame by comparison. But considering the Oscar expert himself said that he was about to spill his own blood from the canned balcony to spice things up, I don't think I'm being unreasonable. Though there is one scene that's in the trailer that I'm calling the zipper window tummy fellatio scene. That was a bit much. Now a lot of you are probably questioning the fact that they've been reporting mass walkouts. But as someone who was actually there, that was not remotely the case. I only saw one person walk out in any moment that could have been considered like gory and it was still a pretty tame moment. And the other four to six people I noticed leave were leaving when it was just like dense moments of expositional dialogue. I most I honestly feel the need to clarify this because I tweeted about a movie premiere having mass walkouts. Like I'm talking like 50 plus people from the balcony that I noticed alone and everyone assumed it was Crimes of the Future. 
but it was Showing Up by Kelly Reichardt. Sorry, Kelly, the pacing just isn't for everyone. Basically, all I'm saying there is don't get wrapped up into the sensationalized marketing and just go in with like tamed expectations in terms of what you're visually going to see on screen. So what do I feel about Crimes of the Future altogether? Well, honestly, super conflicted. I'm really interested by the lore and some of the ideas being explored here, but I felt that a lot of the performances just really felt short, though uh, I feel like I did need more of Kristen Stewart as this weird, horny little freak. It's hilarious. Uh, and Don McKellar was a lot of fun too. I really like the two sides uh, of those uh, employees, which we'll get to in a little bit. And I feel like that's largely because the characters don't really feel like characters. They feel more like vessels of exposition for most of the movie. And even when they were given moments to express things more as like an artistic way, it still came across as awkward at times. So when I was at the press conference and found out that they really didn't do any more than two takes of any shot, like, yeah, I guess I can kind of see it. I'm not saying it's terrible by any means, but I definitely think that they could have done a little bit of work in the scripting phase. Uh, again, is which is something he didn't do. He openly says he wrote it 20 years ago, didn't change a word of it. Good for him though. I'll get to some real specifics in a bit for people who've already seen it or people who just kind of want the rundown before they dive in, but we're gonna start with some spoiler-free thoughts on what the general premise is and how I feel it was handled. So we are specifically following Saul Tenser, a man famous for generating a series of new organs and his performance art partner, Caprice. And it's hard not to see some of the similarities between the Tenser character and Cronenberg himself. Artists with super high reputations that people either revere or question to the point that it may even cause them to start questioning their own place in the artistic ecosystem. Then this movie takes like a very literal look at the idea of like giving up pieces of yourself for your art. Oh, also the thing that everyone assumed was a gross eye torture device, just a camera to see inside the body. Trailer tricks strike again. But the show that Saul and Caprice put on is an artistic surgery where the new organs he's growing are put on display as they're being removed from his body and the two ultimately get pulled into competing sides and maybe it's actually three. You get the people trying to stop these changes as some unnatural path humanity is taking and those looking to actually push it forward into the next stage of human evolution, which is a crime. Then I guess there's a third layer of people who just think that these changes are beautiful and should be left alone in the body. And all that, so interesting. Saul eventually begins to question his place in the world, the function and purpose of what his body does outside side of his art, but it just didn't feel like a lot of these ideas were given enough time to be properly fleshed out. The movie ends up feeling like it should have been called like sex or sensuality of the future, even though there's no actual sex, just things that become proxies for sex and that sensuality. So it ends up feeling like there's two distinct plot direction this movie explored, and instead of committing to one, it tried both, which could have worked, but again, not enough time to do so. The first one is the look at intimacy and how it's changed in the years, how it somehow started fusing with this visceral internal look at bodies and how all that shapes out in the future. Then the sci-fi evolution aspect that feels like it stops just as they're really getting into the meat of it. I will get into specifics there, but the main takeaway is that the whole thing just left me wanting more, leaving me with the hope that this was like a Dune part one type situation. Even if it could be argued that trying to continue from here would have taken away from what Cronenberg was trying to achieve with his conclusion. I will say that watching it the second time helped, but it does just feel like the adaptation of a book that is just so rich with lore and detail and plot, and we're just left with a Cliff Notes version of everything it could be, which is really unfortunate. Didn't hate it by any means, definitely one of my preferred Cronenbergs from the last handful, but it didn't reach the level that I was hoping for. So in a way that is always so tragic, I've ended up in a situation that it feels more compelling to talk about this movie than actually watch it. So as mentioned, the performances they put on are literal surgeries. Caprice has a modified autopsy machine that she uses to cut Saul open and remove these organs that continue to grow inside him. And this takes place after she's tattooed them while they're still inside his body and then cataloging them as they go. It's all a method, as Caprice points out, for Saul to take some kind of control over his body rebelling, which is where the National Organ Registry comes in. Investigators whip it in Timlin, play by Don McKellar and Kristen Stewart are tasked with monitoring people with accelerated evolution syndrome, which is what's causing Saul's body 
ability to rapidly grow new organs and essentially ensure that they're not being allowed to remain in the body, which is a violation of the perceived acceptable human evolutionary line. It's actually a crime just to call it evolution. But while they initially claim to be disgusted by these underground surgeries being performed for show, they are actually quite into it. At least Tim Lin. It reminds me a lot of religious people who claim to hate overt sexuality, but are clearly fascinated by it. And then you know they'd be the freaks. Now I'm describing surgeries being committed as performance art and also saying that the movie is fairly tame graphically for what I think people are expecting. But one of the aspects of how most of humanity is changing is that they're losing the ability to feel pain. Saul feels pain when the organs are being grown and there's a lot of discomfort in terms of eating, but general pain is starting to go away as well as infection. So when you're looking at people being cut in this movie, they're not reacting in pain. It's either neutral or sensual. So I think that half the sympathetic reaction of watching something gross happening on screen is knowing that what I'm watching is causing pain. So without that pain reaction, it doesn't seem to mentally hit in the same way. And honestly, to some extent, I'm sure that's the purpose. I think it's really trying to pull us down to those visceral aspects and desires of this society, how this shared fascination and attraction to the gore is being expressed to the audience. It seems like these people are just so desperate to feel anything that they've landed in an area where this is the only thing that's doing it for them. Traditional sex doesn't even seem to be a main component of pleasure anymore. People are just cutting one another in back alleys. So when I say this movie is more like sex of the future or sensuality of the future, that's what I mean. The crime is there, but it feels like the least fleshed out aspect of the story. However, I do think the idea of people being turned on by watching other people getting cut open or being cut open themselves is probably a different form of crime against humanity. It would be seen as this like subversive thing to what the intended natural order is. Because Stewart's character herself even points out that surgery is the new sex. Surgery is the new sex. So it have to be new sex. Yes. Saul and Caprice's sexual moment is them lying together naked as the machine cuts and pokes holes in them. And of course, as mentioned, we can't forget the zipper tummy fellatio proxy from the trailer, which I guess would absolutely be a crime of humanity if sex itself is losing its function in society. I think this is a movie that leaves a lot of room for individual interpretation. I know Cronenberg clearly has his feelings based on the press conference I attended, but there's a lot of ways the audience can choose to engage with this movie thematically and even in terms terms of the lore, which I think is pretty neat. Though the widespread performance art aspect of it uh, feels a little bit weird, and I feel like Cronenberg himself is making a statement there too. He clearly has an interest in what Saul and Caprice are exploring, but Ear Guy is essentially the butt of the joke, that his dancing is more impressive than the fact that he can grow useless ears all over his body. That he's doing something simply for the shock value and not actually anything new. All style, no substance. I'm not sure if there's other areas of this society that's removed from all this that we're not seeing, but the movie essentially paints these two as rock stars with Saul as a modern Picasso just for growing organs. A major aspect of the story is really based on the idea that anything that happens at their show is gonna end up so widespread that they're the best people that could be approached. But that idea of Saul being Picasso is called out by another investigator who points out that it seems like Caprice would be the real artist because she's the one tattooing the organs and all he has to do is just wait for his body to do something. So there's a lot going on so many interesting things that could be dove into, but the movie itself isn't even two hours long and there is a lot of exposition involved. By the end, I'm just left wishing that there was so much more, even if I do see the value in the actual ending we got. So we're officially on to the spoilers. So if you really just don't wanna know anything about the specifics of this movie, this is where you should hop off. So the movie actually starts in a way that directly ties into what the crime is, but it's gonna take a while to circle back. We've got an unusual boy and a mother that seems to hate him. We never hear him speak, but as he's getting ready for bed, he sits on the floor and starts chowing down on the plastic garbage bin. And as he's eating, some kind of liquid starts pooling out of his mouth, likely some kind of like dissolving saliva that's helping him digest the food and the mom is disgusted. So disgusted that she smothers him to death in his sleep with a pillow before calling someone to tell Lang to get the creature he calls his son. So right away, super interested in what's going on there, but we now cut to our lead character, Saul waking up 
up in this weirdo sleep pod that's constantly shifting around, seemingly in pain. Apparently this bed is supposed to anticipate any kind of pain and discomfort you can feel and adapt itself to solve it. But because Saul's body is constantly making new organs, his body's always shifting, the bed has issues keeping up. A pretty interesting world here. We got beds that anticipate pain, chairs that adjust your body so you can eat and digest food, but Saul's body is constantly rejecting all of it. He can't really swallow anymore and the organ growth in his body seems to be happening more and more rapidly. Which is where the National Organ Registry comes in. When they attend Saul and Caprice's next performance, the two seem fascinated. And Tim Lin specifically seems super turned on by the whole thing. And while they're not supposed to mingle with their subjects this way, it doesn't directly go against anything they're tasked with doing. Because the organs are still coming out, it's not directly violating anything, but she does get a bit pushy and creepy with it down the line which we will get to. This is also when we are reintroduced to the father from the beginning, Lang, who's been eating these unusual purple candy bars, bars that seem to kill anyone else that tries to eat them. So that combined with the fact that his kid could eat plastic, I'm sure there's been some kind of dietary digestive shift here that would absolutely go against what the powers that be are trying to maintain. He's clearly interested in Saul, so when he can finally get him alone, he asks if he'd be interested in performing a live autopsy show on his son's body, which I'm assuming would be to show some kind of internal function that was allowing him to eat plastic. And if all that wasn't enough, Saul is working as some kind of undercover agent for the new vice unit who are trying to find anyone committing these evolutionary crimes. And as much as I enjoyed Detective Cope here, this aspect of the story just felt like it needed more work. I think one of the main reasons for this undercover plot is so that they wouldn't have to actually show certain things on screen. It would be a way for Saul to get information and also so that he'd have a reason to further examine a doctor he finds that is likely doing illegal activity. Because honestly, I don't know if the doctor side plot was that necessary. He is breaking the rules. What he is doing is hosting an inner beauty pageant, an event where instead of removing these organs that are spontaneously growing in people, they are revered and put on display with little tummy zipper windows. A true show of inner beauty. Something that Saul doesn't necessarily agree with, but goes along with, because again, undercover. Honestly, I really think this was just so they could make way for the zipper window proxy fellatio, where Leah Sidhu opens up the zipper and goes to lick it down on his tummy hole. So you might say that this is a pointless side story, but obviously the world could not be deprived of zipper window proxy fellatio and the follow-up of Viggo Mortensen saying, don't let it spill. I think that is the most graphic moment in the movie just for how fucking weird it is, but I still say I have seen and read worse sexual acts from 365 days. Those were real crimes. There was another scene of like some face scarification cutting that maybe was a bit more overt, but still not terrible. But the big surprise about this pageant is that Whippet, the other organ registry agent, is in charge of the registrations for it. And unlike Tim Lin's obsession with the surgical shows, which we will definitely touch on again, Whippet's involvement in the pageant is a direct violation of the law and goes against the entire purpose of his job, which is all about removal and documentation. And Tim Lin can kind of tell that there's something going on with him and plans to turn him in. Don't you worry, girl, Saul's undercover. So immediately after Whippet reveals himself to Saul and he's about to leave, Timlin commandeers him. Yes, he thought it was a good idea to like share the fact that he's violating the law in like the same building his coworker works in. And like, if you worked with this kind of weird little freak, you just assume she's always listening. But Timlin gets him quartered in a room to talk about how tantalized she is by he and Caprice's shows and how much she'd love to be a part of one someday, how she'd love for him to operate on her. Just because I would love to find myself in that Sark module with you at the controls. Which is essentially the equivalent of, hey, you guys looking for a third? Y'all in one of those polyamorous sexual surgical relationships? Honestly, the last thing I ever wanted to see is Kristen Stewart sticking her hands in Viggo Mortensen's mouth, trying to come on to him, licking his saliva, only to have him respond with, I'm not so good at the old sex. <sighs> she fucking sold it though. Now, if you're wondering how the movie is juggling so many different angles and aspects, 
It could be better. It's a bit of a fumbled juggle. Again, the movie's only an hour and 47 minutes long, and for a story that just seems so dense with potential lore and story and examination of a shifting humanity and how that reflects in our own culture, just take the other 30 minutes, man. Flesh some shit out in a way that doesn't just feel like an exposition dump. Because there is another angle juggled in. Again, there's a company that makes all these weird devices, the bed, the feeding chair, the autopsy machine, things that are supposed to make existence more easy and comfortable for people. And we're introduced to two employees for this company as they come to calibrate Saul's tech to his ever-changing body. And they are super obsessed with the modified autopsy machine that Saul and Caprice use for their shows, but they also seem to be hired hip people. At first, I thought that they were also just kind of like horny little weirdos that had a grand reverence for the tech that they work on, but no. They show up at the doctor's house saying that they're there to calibrate some of his devices and then kill him. My best guess is that the Lifeform tech company is either acting like super rogue for their own interest or with the government to take out potential biological deviance and anyone looking to encourage this deviance in other people and these two are just as much undercover murder agents as they are techs. Likely because of the delicate ecosystem that exists in which they literally sell the machines to keep people comfortable in this ever-changing world. So as long as the government is pushing back against that next step in evolution, they stay flush and in business. So obviously they're cool with Sol and Caprice because they're literally building fame out of the idea that whatever is happening in people's body is unnatural, it's chaotic, it should be removed. Making the government agenda cool through subversion. But that rounds us back to the autopsy on the kid Brecken. All the father Lang has said at this point is that the autopsy would reveal something beautiful to the world. So Saul decides that he wants to talk to the murder mom to find out why she killed her own kid. So we finally get some answers on Brecken, some that were very obviously inferred by watching, but he's essentially the next step in human evolution. A boy born of old sex whose body is naturally designed to survive off and consume synthetic materials. Making the implication that in this world, the next step is in finding ways to eradicate the waste we create, it's to evolve along with it until we reach the point of it becoming our food source. And the mom killed him because she believed it was unnatural, that he wasn't human, it was just too much for her to live with. But it seems like it's where the bodies have been naturally trying to go. It's why so many people have begun struggling with simple survival functions like eating. So finding this out is calling into question Sol and Caprice's entire life's work of believing that they were creating some kind of meaning out of emptiness. And on an even bigger level, it's calling into question the entire nature of humanity. Something the government is definitely trying to stop from happening and their big issue with Lang is that he is trying to speed up this process through surgeries. He found a way to make it so that anybody's body can digest plastics. Which is why Lang wants this public autopsy. He wants the world to see what human evolution is working towards and how it can be achieved faster to essentially open Pandora's box. He's the leader of a worldwide organization that's performing surgeries on people to set them up to also be able to digest synthetic materials. So that's what the purple bars are and why that other guy drew dropped dead the second he ingested it. And if his son can't be the living proof of this natural evolution, his death will have to do it instead. So at this point, Saul really begins to question whether or not he's been wrong about what his body has been doing. If he's constantly been stopping and fighting against something that would finally bring some peace into his life. So he and Caprice agree to perform the autopsy as a show, but something goes wrong. They open up Brecken and all of his organs have been tattooed. It looks grotesque, due in part likely to the decay, but mostly because of the shoddy tattoo work. Leading Caprice to take the performance into the direction of the ugliness of the outside world seeping into our youngest and most beautiful, that the world is killing our children from the inside out. And just a note on that, I know that Cronenberg's been pretty jazzed on this aspect of the script because we're now realizing how present microplastics are and how they have been invading our bodies and bloodstreams and being passed on to children. But this is another part where we just kind of get an information dump and don't see what happens. Detective Cope reveals that they had someone inside Lang's operation, which is how they got access to Brecken's body. And it was Timlin who tattooed the organs to take away from any display of the natural plastic digestive function. And Lang is broken. It was like seeing his son die a second time. But don't worry, he doesn't have to dwell on that for too long. The life form tech girls kill him too. So now he's probably gonna be a martyr. 
better. I assume because it basically works into its conclusion from here. Saul realizes that it's probably time to stop fighting against the changes that happen inside him. That by killing Lang, Life Tech's essentially shown that it's not just about stopping something that's dangerous, but to prevent their own obsolescence. Cope swears he didn't know about that murder being planned or played out, so there is a chance that like the Life Tech company is working independently, but I think that it is equally or just as likely or absolutely likely that a larger government agency has its hand involved and it's a symbiotic relationship just like we see in the real world. So after another massive struggle of trying to eat a meal, Caprice sets up a camera to record him trying the synthetic candy bar. And the second he starts eating, the machine just stops moving as if his body is in perfect alignment to digest and he can actually swallow. His body has finally stopped waging war against him and a single tear falls down his face before it cuts to credits. Essentially making the assertion that he wouldn't really need a surgery to prime himself for it. His body has been trying to get him there the entire time. And I like this aspect of it. It's like he finally realizes that the hate he's had for this aspect of himself that also brought him great success was killing him by trying to avoid it, by trying to avoid the change. So you can only assume that he does manage to eat it without dying and Caprice will go on to upload that footage and Pandora's box will be open either way. And that's the movie. Lots of interesting concepts here is like the idea of the government trying to control human evolution and likely hide the fact that people would actually be better off if they just let it happen, either for financial reasons or because it would genuinely start to call into question what it even means to be human. The mom thought Brecken was inhuman and I'm sure there are a lot of people who would want to see themselves as purist would never allow themselves get to the point where they're literally chomping down their own garbage cans for sustenance. But I guess it's just hard to watch a movie like this and not just think about the potential of what it could have been and how many layers you kind of build yourself from just talking about it and then you watch it again and like a lot of that stuff just like isn't fleshed out well. I think on a certain level, the movie's absolutely achieving everything that it wants to, but the story that message is being wrapped in has too many moving parts that don't feel comfortably fleshed out. I know a lot of people are gonna dig the hell out of this though, for the ambiance, the music, the ideas, just every piece working together just hits that brain receptor. And I know a lot of people really hate it. And I ended up somewhere in between, mostly on the favorable side because I really enjoyed the world it opened up and I've had a lot of fun thinking about it. But that's gonna do it for today's video. Let me know what you guys are thinking in the comment section down below if you have caught the movie, if you wanna catch the movie. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.